let's wait a couple more minutes for people mm -hmm. to arrive, and then we'll start. So does the talk usually take for 90 minutes or is it usually one hour and the rest 30 minutes is for discussion or, or questions? Uh, usually there's a lot of discussion during the talk. Mm -hmm. um, I see, yeah. that's why you so, have a 90 minute window. Yeah, actually it's it's not a hard cutoff though. So, mm -hmm. so don't feel worried about the time. Well, I mean, people will have to leave at some point, but you know, we can stay and discuss. Okay, I think we can begin. Yeah. So uh, welcome to the CMSA Quantum Matter Seminar. Uh, today, we're happy to have Yiji Yu from Princeton University tell us about fracton critical point topological phase transitions beyond renormalization. Um, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ryan, for the introduction. And today, I will talk about new type of fracton quantum critical point and uh, phase transition, which is beyond the usual renormalization group picture. And first I have to apologize because some of you, some of you from the audience might hear part of the content from, uh, from an, another workshop, from other fractal workshop or the Washington INT workshop. So apologize for any overlap content. Uh, since today, my main topic is about a phase transition. So in the first few minutes, let's have an overview of the historic development for phase transition and critical phenomena. So throughout history, there are two milestones which enhance our understanding on phase transitions and a critical point. The first is known as the Ginsberg-Landau theory for phase transition. And what they demonstrate is different phases are in general different in terms of their symmetry patterns. So some phases have a symmetry breaking fat pattern and some, some phases are disordered and symmetry invariant. And hence, in principle, there could appear a continuous phase transition, which connect a symmetry breaking phase versus a symmetry invariant, or sometimes we call it a disorder phase. And in order to characterize both phases and the phase transition, we can define a Landau order parameter, which is usually characterized in terms of some local physical observable, like spin polarization of valence bond. And the fluctuation of such local order parameter finally give rise to the spontaneous symmetry breaking. At a quantum critical point, the local order parameter is strongly fluctuated. And once the order parameter condensate, then we break a certain type of symmetries and then the spontaneous symmetry breaking happens. And the second milestone, which enhance our understanding for critical phenomenon, especially the universality of a critical phenomenon is the renormalization group picture developed by Wilson and Fisher. And what renormalization group picture emphasize is at a quantum critical point, we have scale invariance and a correlation lens diverge. So we have to visualize everything at a larger spatial scale. And hence what renormalization do is, in principle, we can usually core screen out some local fluctuation and the local degree of freedom and only keep the long wavelength physics or long wavelength mode as the essential description of a quantum of a quantum or thermal critical point. 
And today, what I will do is I will introduce a new type of quantum critical point, which is beyond the historic paradigm. So the historic paradigm tell us most phase transition can be characterized in terms of the Ginzburg-Landau theory, where one phase we have a symmetry breaking pattern, the other phase we have a symmetry invariant pattern. So different phases are different in terms of the symmetry pattern. However, during the past few decades, due to the exploration of topological phases, including some symmetry protected topological phases, we now recognize that there exists a large number of exotic phases. They do not have any symmetry breaking pattern. In the symmetry sense, they're, they're, they look the same as any disorder phase. However, there are some intrinsic quantum entanglement patterns, which still make it different compared to the disorder phases. And in principle, there could be a critical point or continued phase transition connect two phases with the same symmetry pattern, but distinct topological patterns. So this topic is actually well explored during the past few decades and the well-known examples are the quan ho plateau transition where two phases have the same symmetry pattern, but they're different in terms of their chain number or in terms of their quantized whole conductance. And also in some 1D quantum spin chain, there is a continual phase transition between a Hodan chain, which is a paramagnetic chain with a zero mode, protected zero mode at the edge toward a trivial quantum spin chain with no entanglement. Second, historically, we know that renormalization can almost explain any, any type of critical phenomenon. And the essence of renormalization lies in the fact that the long wavelength physics is very important. That is why we usually just coarse going out of the local fluctuation and only keep those long wavelength modes as the essential description of critical phenomenon. However, today in our new type of quantum critical point, it is beyond renormalization in the sense that a large number of short wavelength modes plays an extremely important role. In particular, these short wavelength modes can still survive as the low energy excitation at quantum critical point. And it is those short wavelength modes or short wavelength physics that controls and manipulate the behavior at a quantum critical point. Okay, so to begin with, let's first have some review of the well-known topological phase transitions. So this is an, this is an old topic. And uh, during the past few decades, we realized there are a large number of symmetry protected topological phases. And in principle, especially in lower dimension, there could appear some novel quantum criticality, which connect a symmetry protected topological phases versus a trivial phase. And uh, here, what I want to bring about is, we know a symmetry protected topological phase does not have any symmetry breaking pattern and uh, there they're the same in terms of the symmetry pattern compared to a disorder phase. However, they carry some topological properties. They have a topological invariant or they can be labeled by a topological index, which is quantized or discrete due to some symmetry constraint. And these topological index or topological invariant are definitely well defined in the gapped SPT phase. But the question here is, how does these topological invariant or topological index behave? at a quantum critical point or what happened to these topological invariant when we are about to proximate to the quantum critical point or phase transition point. And the second is, does these topological information, especially the topological term or symmetry protected topological term can potentially change the universality or the quantum critical point when you are proximate to the phase transition point? So to answer this question, let's review a well-known example of a topological phase transition in one spatial dimension, which is the phase transition of a Hardin chain. So Hardin chain is a quantum spin chain, which contains two spin one half degree of freedom per unit cell and a fixed point ground state for the Hardin phase that the spins between two units, between the unit cell has a ferromagnetic interaction so they are projected to an SU2 singlet. So inside the bulk, every spin pair into a singlet with the nearby bond. And once you encounter with the boundary, there appear a dangling spin one half degree of freedom that is not paired with any of the nearby partner and in the presence of some symmetry like a time reversal symmetry. The spin one half degree of freedom always have 
a twofold degeneracy localized at a boundary which cannot be lifted. And in film theory, a straightforward way for us to understand the Haldane chain is the nonlinear sigma model description. Because we have a spin degree of freedom, so in principle, we can introduce an O3 rotor degree of freedom where each component characterizes the spin polarization in, in the XYZ direction. And the Haldane chain corresponds to a fluctuating nonlinear sigma model with an O3 theta term at theta equal two pi. Okay, and now let's see how can we drive a phase transition from this Hauden chain toward any, any trivial disorder chain. So the model is pretty simple and it's well studied in, in different ways. So it's just a two type of Heisenberg interaction. So we have a Heisenberg interaction between the spins between different unit cells. And we also have a Heisenberg interaction between the two spin one half within the same unit cell. So when the interunit cell Heisenberg interaction dominant, then we just have an, something like a Hauden chain or AKLT chain, which corresponds to theta equal two pi, and it has a protected spin one half H state. On the other side, if the intraunit cell Heisenberg interaction dominant, then we just have a trivial chain because the two spins pair into a singular. This is almost equivalent to a spin zero chain with no entanglement between any unit cell. And this corresponds to a nonlinear sigma model with theta equal zero. So it's just a fluctuating O3 rotor. And once we tune the ratio J at a symmetric point, there appear a continued phase transition between the Haldane chain at theta equal two pi toward the trivial chain at theta equal zero. So how do we understand this quantum critical point between two phases with the same symmetry pattern, but a distinct topological invariant. There are various ways to tackle this problem. And today I will just uh, provide a pictorial argument. So these two competing interaction, one favors an intracyte singlet bond and the other favors an intracyte singlet bond. And once these two interactions are comparable, then what we can imagine is at a quantum critical region, there is a domain wall where in some region, the spins are paired within the unit cell while the, in the other region, the spins are paired between the unit cell correspond to theta equal two pi. At a quantum critical point when both interactions are comparable, the domain wall between two distinct patterns with different theta value proliferate in a bulk. And what happened to the domain wall? The domain wall is the zero dimensional defect between theta equal two pi and theta equal zero. And there is a unpaired spin one half degree of freedom with twofold degeneracy and the presence of time reversal symmetry. So this domain one is nothing but something like the edge of the Hauden chain, which separate the Hauden chain and the trivial chain are separate the Hauden chain versus the vacuum. At a quantum critical point, the domain one is strongly fluctuate in space time and hence, the free spin one half degree of freedom decorate inside domain wall is also fluctuating in space time. And how do we describe such kind of fluctuation? So domain wall is something like a kink where theta shift from zero to two pi and inside the domain wall, the zero dimensional defect carries a spin one half degree of freedom. And the simplest way to describe the spin one half is we can just uh, write down an O3 level one Wesumi Wheaton term in zero dimension, which exactly shows the spin coherent pass integral of a spin one half degree of freedom. And this domain will strongly fluctuate in space time. So in principle, now we can introduce a four component rotor where the first three component still correspond to the spin rotation degree of freedom. And the fourth component, the additional scalar correspond to the value of theta. Well, in both phases, theta is fixed in two, two, zero and two pi. And at a quantum critical point, the value of theta is strongly fluctuate. And whenever theta encounter with a domain wall, which change from two pi to zero, there is a free spin one half degree of freedom decorate inside the domain wall. Such kind of <coughs> decoration can be characterized in terms of the O4 level one, where zoom in the Wheaton term, 
which implies that whenever we have a domain wall of theta, where theta jumps from 2 pi to 0, it carries an O3 level 1 Weizumann Witten term, which exactly represents a spin 1 half degree of freedom. And at a quantum critical point, the spin rotation symmetry, at least part of spin rotation symmetry, like time reversal symmetry is not breaking. And also the theta is strongly fluctuating in space. So the quantum critical point is actually described in terms of a O4 level one where zoom in a Witten term in one spatial dimension. So this is a historic understanding of the quantum phase transition between the Hauden chain and the trivial chain. And the take home message we learn from this pictorial argument is when we drive a phase transition between an SPT chain toward a trivial chain, what happened is the previous H mode now dissolve into the bulk because they appear inside a domain wall between two distinct regions. So inside the bulk, there is something like the percolation between the SPT region and the trivial patterns and these domain wall decorate with the previous H mode dissolve into the bulk and strongly fluctuate in space time. Because this domain wall carries some non-trivial quantum number, the quantum phase transition between the SPT chain and the trivial chain contains an additional O4 level one Weizumann in the Witten term that exactly characterize the fact that domain wall carries a spin one half degree of freedom. So the quantum critical point is different from the usual quantum critical point in a symmetry breaking pattern. Okay, so I now we- have a, I have a question here. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so here you discuss a Hodan chain of this uh, spin one. And you know that uh, the Hodan- uh, Actually, chain... it doesn't need to be spin one here. I'm just considering uh, two spin one half inside the unit cell, but they don't need to be projected into spin one. Yeah, they don't have to be. But then my question is that, uh, the Hodan phase also apply to this spin two uh, Heisenberg model. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in some sense, uh, one can use in the similar AKLT uh, picture and uh, say there may be a boundary of this uh, uh, spin one uh, boundary gapless excitation. Mm -hmm. Then one may have a similar this uh, uh, domain wall perforation picture. Then you have mm -hmm. this uh, perforation for spin one. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether uh, there, whether one have a similar picture, so whether there still must be a phase transition, and uh, uh, also basically, what is the distinction between even spin, uh, spin chain, and uh, all the spin, uh, spin chain? Mm -hmm. Both, yeah. Yeah, you might be an expert on this, but actually, that depends. First, depend on what type of symmetry do you want to constrain, because that depends on whether you can get rid of this any theta term or not. Here, the symmetry I. I, I need is not uh, any rotation symmetry, just a time reversal symmetry. So if you have either spin two or something like two copy of them, like a spin ladder. Yeah. In principle, if you just have time reversal symmetry, you can couple them in an interferomagnetic way and hence total get rid of the spin one half zero mode inside. So inside the domain wall, it is a spin zero degree of freedom and hence such kind of Weizumann Witten term can disappear. And in principle, there's it is not necessary to have a phase transition connect the spin zero phase and the spin two phase. I see. So you'll say, uh, if you only have a time reversal symmetry, uh, maybe this is spin one extension can be, this three, four degenerates can be split. It. And uh, so you may not have a gapless mode at the domain wall. Mm -hmm, true. So that's, a, that's a, how the chain is pictured. True. Okay. So in principle, I just have ferromagnetic interaction then they're projected to the spin zero channel. So in the domain wall, it's vacuum and it's nothing. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, excuse me, maybe follow up with uh, a mm -hmm. similar question. So mm -hmm. is there a, a way to phrase uh, either physically or also mathematically, either is fine, that uh, you're saying this WZW term will be some mod two, in the sense two of them can be trivial? Is, is there some, I think I probably heard some argument somewhere also maybe from other perspective, but are there some statement you can make along this line? Say so this, this WZW is mod two, which means two of them will be trivial. Uh, it's not a WZWZ is mod two. It's more like uh, first I have two copy of them and then I want to see whether there is any coupling between this O4 rotor that respect the 
at least respect the time reversal symmetry, and I can totally get rid of them. And in principle, if you have an antiferromagnetic interaction between two O3 rotor from, 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 from both sides of the ladder, then actually you have a O4 level one, why zooming in the Witten term, the other becomes an O4 uh, level minus one, why zooming in the Witten term, they exactly cancel. Right, great. And, and how can do you, you see explain again? Can you explain again the bottom of this slide? What 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 is this continuum Lagrangian? This one. Uh, do you mean this one? Yes. Uh huh. So this Lagrangian, this n is a four component vector where the first three component is our previous O three rotor, and the fourth component n four correspond to the value of theta. Or correspond to something thing like uh, it's not a valent, usual yeah. valence bound and order. It's whether it's pairing intraside or interside. And what is u? Uh, this one. So you have an index mu. What is the original index mu run over? Okay, so, so sorry. Here, this mu is the space time. Okay, so, so it's, it's one is plus it, one. Is zero one, right? Yes, t t n uh, x. Oh, t, t, and, t and X. And what are the indices? What is U? What are the indices? Uh, this one. No. U is uh, actually the extended dimension because I need to write down the O4 level one was in a Witten term. So I extend it on a, a hyper semi sphere where when U equals U goes from zero to one. And when it is one, that is, that is the value of the O4 rotor. And when u is zero, it's something like the North Pole. And I assume that at the North Pole, everything polarized in the, in the, in one direction. So the integral, if you look at the action, the integral uh, that you have to do, how many dimensions are there? Are there three? Yes, one plus one is the space time, and u is the extended dimension. Okay, and then how is this related to the picture above? How is related with the picture above? So for the spin one half degree of freedom, we write down the O3 level one where zoom in the Witten term. The domain wall itself is zero dimension, but here I again extend one dimension, which is the dimension of U. So the O3 rotor is defined on a semi sphere. And how is it related with this one? So this is an extended dimension. This is in zero dimension, but it was an extended U. And zero plus one dimension, this is in one plus one dimension. So theta depends on x, but I think in the picture, theta seems to depend on x. Right? Mm, you mean he, here? No, in the picture, if you go up, you have a change. Yes, and yes. Theta is zero on one yes. side and two pi of the other. Yes, so it depends on x. And here, this term only shows this domain wall, zero, zero, zero spatial dimension domain wall. And in this term, we only consider, we don't consider theta. We are considering inside the domain wall of theta, the zero plus one D quantum mechanical degree of freedom is this so O3 level one with the Witten term. So should we think of the full Lagrangian as the one that you have in the line below plus the one? Yes, the yes. Uh, so the whole Lagrangian is this one, is this one. This one without the one above. True, true. The one above, I just want to say that a spin one half degree of freedom can be written in terms of the O3 level one wise room in the Winton term. Okay, go on. Sorry, ask a question. Question? Sorry, maybe mine is related, so maybe I finish what I want. Mm -hmm. so you just mentioned O4 level one and O4 level minus one, right? Instead of a two of O4 level one. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that part again? 
I okay. need an intuition for why one over level one over level minus one. That, that's related to the is that that's related to the fact what a two layer of a spin one or maybe even a spin two case will be a trivial non SPT. Is that the the related statement? If that's related and if you have intuition, can you explain that part? Thank you. Yes. So it's something like first I have two copy uh, and I never couple them. And then one way to demonstrate that two copy can be trivialized is if I turn on the antiferromagnetic interaction such that the O3 rotor here and one and two and three and O3 rotor here to the have antiferromagnetic interaction. So they're just a polarized in different direction. So I have N1 and I equals minus N I tilde. And then what happened is here is O4 level one. And here, because these two are polarized, they are for level one. And then they can be canceled. And in principle, you may say that for spin two, it's more like we have a, we have a ferromagnetic interaction, which has a tendency to project them not to spin zero mode, uh, to protect them into spin two mode. And then it seems something like we have over level two. And then the question is by tuning the coupling between the, this ladder from either spin zero or spin two mode, is there necessary to have a phase transition? And the answer is no. So that is why these two, zero and the two, are adiabatically kinetic, because as long as we find one specific path or specific Hamiltonian with a specific interaction and tunable parameter to connect them without any gap closing in the bulk, then they are adiabatically connected. Okay, thanks. I, th I think I see why I'm confused about that. Mm -hmm. N1, N2, and N3 are dynamical variables that fluctuate. Mm -hmm. But N4 is a classical variable. It's not going to fluctuate. At a quantum critical point, it is fluctuate. N4? So you wrote yeah. a Lagrangian. The Lagrangian that you wrote below, which, what is dynamical and what is classical? So N4 can be defined in terms of a valence bound order parameter, like is I, this is I. I no, I'm, you wrote a continuum Lagrangian. I'm just trying to understand what you mean by the continuum Lagrangian, which you wrote. The one that starts with one of the G. So N4 is more like the valence bound solid, which shows whether you are intraside pair or interside pair. At a quantum critical point, at both phases, you have a valence bound order. You are either paired inside or outside. But at a quantum critical point, there is no ordering. And hence, N4 is strongly fluctuated in space time. I just want to understand the Lagrangian that you wrote. In the mm -hmm. Lagrangian that you wrote, are there three independent ends? Or of four. Four, four. independent ends. And are there constraints such as the sum of the square is one? Uh, actually, no. No? The constraint is O3 cross a scalar field. Are the ends uh, between, what are the values of n? Are they integers, continuous variables, real, circle value, what are they? So the first three component, it is an O3 rotor. So their square is one. The fourth is a scalar. It's continuous. Okay, so N1 plus N square plus N2 square plus N3 square is constrained to be one? Yes. Okay, so there are two degrees of freedom there. And is N4 classical or not? It's quantum. It's quantum. But then I don't understand what it has to do with the previous system. You started the story with spin a half fields and so forth mm -hmm. in O3 sigma model. Mm -hmm. And you wrote that, that was on the previous slides. So you had 
three ends to sum was one and theta was a number, not, not a dynamical field. Mm -hmm. Now you say the theta fluctuates. Mm -hmm. So is it the same system or not the same? The same system. So previously what happened is in both phases, N4 is ordered. And in principle, in the UV level, the theta term doesn't need to be a fixed number. They can choose any arbitrary number. However, when you go into the IR fixed point, theta only take discrete values in the fixed point, like zero and two pi are stable fixed point. Pi is a unstable fixed point. So in both phases, N4, rows an expectation value, which is theta, that is not quantized, doesn't need to be quantized in the UV level, but at the IR level, they still have discrete fixed point, like zero and two pi. And uh, at the quantum uh, critical uh, point, sorry, N4 just, is again. We talked about SO4 before. I thought the O4 comes if N1 square plus N2 square plus N3 square plus N4 mm -hmm. square is constrained to be one, not just mm -hmm. the sum of the first three. Mm -hmm. So one problem is, if you have O3 cross a scalar, then in principle, it's not a equivalent to an O4 rotor because the amplitude still fluctuate. And once you have a fluctuating amplitude, it's hard to determine whether this O4 level one by zooming the Wheaton term has a quantized coefficient or not. And here, one argument we can do is, first we begin with O4, and then we assume there is some NSOT easy plane, hyperplane, and anisotropy, which break it into O3 cross a scalar. Okay, go on. Uh, sorry, can I ask? Some... Oh, I want to go on and to, to the next slide. Okay. So, so let me finish this slide and you can ask questions. Okay. So now we have show a pictorial way to understand the Hodan chain toward the trivial chain phase transitions. And here, from this pictorial argument, we know that a quantum critical point is affected by the nearby phases because the previous theta term now becomes the Wesum and Wheaton term, which can potentially change the universality of the quantum critical point. So this critical point of the Hodan phase versus trivial phase is described by the SU2 level one Wesum and Wheaton theory. And next question we actually want to answer is, well, can we go into higher, first, can we go into higher dimension and find a similar quantum critical point between some, some type of SPT phases versus a trivial phase? And then what I will introduce today is in two spatial dimension, there is a similar picture where it could appear a continual phase transition between a high order topological insulator toward a trivial mod insulator with the same symmetry pattern, but distinct topological pattern. And uh, such kind of phase transition is also beyond the ginzburg landau theory because we have two phases with the same symmetry pattern but distinct topological index. And it's also beyond the renormalization group picture because there we will find there is a large number of short wavelength modes or short wavelength physics which survive at a quantum critical point. So the critical point is actually controlled and manipulated by the short wavelength fluctuation. So Liu Jun, what is your question now? Oh, thanks. Uh... Uh, first is a follow-up question of Xiaogang's. Uh, let me phrase mm -hmm. the question in the following way. Uh, we know if, the, if in one plus one D, if a system has time reversal symmetry, then there's a non-trivial SPT and a trivial one. Mm -hmm. uh, can this non-trivial SPT be realized in a spin two system? No, uh, you mean I have a spin two chain and uh, realize this non-trivial SPT? Yeah. I guess it can, right? In principle, it can, because actually spin zero, uh, spin two or spin one itself, it's in a, in a, in a, in a IR physics, it doesn't uh, make any sense. So what really makes sense is that uh, your onside is linear or projective. So sp only spin integer and a spin half integer makes a difference. And uh, in principle, yes, although I'm not sure I can have a very rigorous argument to say that the, the following uh, procedure does not make any gap closing. So suppose I have a spin two chain, which is I have four spin one half and project them into the into the into the spin two channel. And then uh, there are also some interactions between the sites. And then I slightly change it for these four spins. Two of them 
I project them into the singlet and the rest of two, I still make it spin one. And uh, then if they have antiferromagnetic interaction, that is akin to the AKL teaching. However, I'm not sure whether one can design a very concrete uh, either MPS state representation or a very concrete Hamiltonian to show that uh, for that uh, spin two chain, we can have a concrete uh, simple Hamiltonian or MPS representation to show it really does not break, uh, it really uh, fulfill that hot end phase. I, I think you can, uh, I think it's possible. Even for spin one chain, you can have a trivial yes. SPT. So you just need to stack a trivial spin one SPT and a non-trivial spin one SPT together with some ferromagnetic coupling. Yes, but if you really want a spin two degree of freedom on the side, then I don't know. If oh. you allow them to have some inter internal degree of freedom, which can switch it from spin two to spin one or something like you attach it, it's more like a spin three. And finally, we uh, gap out some of the degree of freedom, make it back to spin one. That's another story. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, another question is, uh, is the anomaly of SU2 level K classified by Z2 or Z? You didn't mention this, but I just want to ask. Actually, I'm not sure here we really have SU2 oh, level um, K anomaly. What I really mean is uh, if you take two copies of SU2 level two, uh, sorry, uh, two copies of SU2 level one, uh, is it anomaly for you or anomalous? Mm, but here, actually, we don't really have SU2 symmetry. That's the problem because for if you, you, if you have SU2 symmetry, then the classification is different. Yeah, I'm asking if you, I'm asking this question just within SU2 level one, if I have two copies with this full SO4 symmetry, is the anomaly classified by Z2 or Z? I think it's classified think, by Z, right? Yes, because it's more like a perturbative anomaly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And mm -hmm. if you have really have SO4 symmetry, then, oh, then it's hard to imagine how to couple them and get rid of the Wesumi Witten term if you have multiple copies. Mm. Thanks. Okay, so let me go into the story. So we want to extend it into 2D and recognize where there is a similar phase transition appear. And if that exists, then how can we describe such kind of phase transition? So now let's look at a 2D analogy. So in two spatial dimension, we're still dealing with a spin system or something like a hot cold boson, where in each unit cell, I have four spin one half or say four hot cold boson degree of freedom. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Say it's a Z anomaly, Chen Sam's term for the SO. We have four spin degree of freedom. And the Hamiltonian I begin with, uh, exactly solvable Hamiltonian, is pretty simple. Such that for each spin or each hard core boson, there is a ring exchange term between the four spins living at a corner of each plug K. And this ring exchange term would project the four spin into a four spin max maximal entangled state like this. That's it. That's the Hamiltonian I begin with. And hence the bulk degree of freedom would be fully gapped because all of the spins are paired into a plaque entangled state. And then we want to look at the, what happened on the boundary because at a, boundary, at a smooth boundary, there will be two dangling spins that is not paired. And in principle, we I can I can turn on any arbitrary small Heisenberg interaction between the spins within the same unit cell that is the pink island to gap out the degree of freedom on the smooth boundary. However, the tricky thing appears at the rough boundary. At a rough boundary or something we call the corner, we will have a three dangling spin, and if we have any arbitrary small Heisenberg interaction between the spin within the same unit cell. In principle, two of them could be fully gap out, but there is still a dangling spin with a twofold degeneracy, which cannot be lifted. If you have time reversal symmetry. So this Hamiltonian finally fulfill something like what they called a high order topological later, where the bulk degree of freedom contains a gap 
The smooth part of the boundary also contains a gap, but the rough part of the boundary contains a twofold degeneracy or zero energy mode that cannot be lifted. Then let's look at what type of symmetry do we have in this Hamiltonian or what type of symmetry we want to maintain in the Hamiltonian. So first we have time reversal symmetry. And second, we also have a special type of symmetry, which is what I call the subsystem symmetry. So if I take any arbitrary row or any arbitrary column, so remember the pink island is regarded as the same side or same unit cell, and we don't distinguish the degree of freedom within them. The, there is a subsystem U1 symmetry such that the SZ component or the magnet is conserved on any arbitrary row any, and any arbitrary column. And this is also manifest by the fact that I only allow intersite to have a ring exchange term. So in principle, there's no single magnon hoping between sites. Instead, such kind of ring exchange term would take a magnon particle hole pair and let them transport along the transverse direction. So the magnon quantum number, or say the SZ quantum number, is not just conserved globally. On any row and any column, they're conserved. So we have a subsystem U1 symmetry, such that the U1 quantum number for SZ is conserved on any arbitrary row and any arbitrary column. Actually, in the presence of both time reversal symmetry and the subsystem U1 symmetry, this higher order topological insulator is robust and the zero mode living at a rough patch of the boundary, or say living at the corner, is protected by time reversal in the subsystem U1 symmetry. So now, just as how we learn about any type of SPT phase. If we say this is an SPT phase, we probably either want a field theory description with a topological term enforced by symmetry, or we want to figure out whether there is any topological invariant which can be treated as a fingerprint to characterize this phase. Uh, there are various ways to figure out the topological invariant. And uh, here, I will begin with the simplest way. So in order to figure out the topological invariant, the simplest way, at least for me, is since here we have a subsystem U1 symmetry, in principle, I can gauge that symmetry or let it decoupled with an external probe electromagnetic field and figure out what type of linear response do we have. And if there exists a linear response whose coefficient is quantized, or only take discrete value in the presence of a certain symmetry constraint, then this quantized linear response could be treated as a good fingerprint as a topological invariant. So let's do that. Mm. So here we have a subsystem U1 symmetry. How do we gauge the subsystem U1 symmetry or say, how do we couple it to, a, to an external electromagnetic field? So remember, because of subsystem U1 symmetry, a magnon, or say a hardcore boson, cannot hold between sites like this. And the only dynamics between the unit cell is we should have a ring exchange term, which transport a particle hole pair like a dipole and let them hold in the transverse direction. So if I gauge the subsystem U1 symmetry, then I should introduce a gauge potential living at the center of each plaque, and that gauge potential is what I call AXY, only one spatial component. And the minimal coupling between the gauge potential is the gauge potential minimal couple with any ring exchange term. This is the only spatial component of the gauge potential. And we also have a time component A0, which would couple with the charge density and they have the following gauge transformation. And now I only look at a linear response at a leading order, at a tadpole order with one gauge potential lag. And then what we will find is the only gauge invariant term that is allowed is this quadrupolarization term. And the coefficient in the front is what we call it, the quadrupole moment, which coupled with something like a high rank electromagnetic field. This is the only term that is allowed out of the tight pole order. However, here we are not just seeking for any type of linear response. We're looking for any linear response which can be quantized or whose coefficient only take discrete value because what we want is a topological response. 
So what happened to the choice of the quadrupole moment in front of this quadrupolarization term? So first, once we have subsystem symmetry and once this higher rank gauge field A is compact, one can demonstrate that the coefficient theta in the front has a periodicity under two pi. So once theta shift by two pi, the action would be invariant. So theta equals zero and theta equal two pi are the same. And second, we have a time reversal symmetry, although it has act on the hot cold boson more like a particle symmetry. Under such kind of symmetry, we will find this quadrupolarization term would change sign under this symmetry. So theta becomes minus theta. However, we know that the ground state is symmetry invariant. So the linear response function should also manifest such symmetry. And hence to maintain the symmetry, what we will find is now theta can only take some discrete value. They can only take either zero or pi because theta ha again has a periodic city under two pi. So here under these two symmetry constraints, what we can demonstrate here is this quadrupolarization can only take discrete value. And it's a Z2 value where we can only take either zero and pi. And the pi value of theta actually correspond to our high order topological insulator while the zero value of theta correspond to any vacuum or any trivial mild insulator. I'm sorry, why is theta to, uh, to pi periodic? Mm -hmm. Oh, why it is periodic. So yeah. this term is a total derivative term. If we have periodic boundary condition, then what we can think about is I can throw a large gauge transformation for the subsystem U1 symmetry and see how does the action change under such kind of flux insertion or more like large gauge transformation. And remember here, because it's subsystem symmetry. So in principle, I can only throw a two pi flux on a specific row without touching the other. And then what would happen is the action would shift it by theta, by theta over two pi times the total flux. And once theta takes any number like two pi times an integer, then your action is only shift by two pi. <clears throat> which does not change the underlying physics. That is why we can demonstrate that theta has a periodicity under two pi shift. I, am, I sort of understand that in the context of the previous slide where you were on the lattice, but here you're in the continuum. So uh, actually I'm, I'm always at a lattice. Uh, so this, this should be replaced by the lattice differential. In the continuum actually is such kind of but, uh, gapped phase. Yeah, on, the on the lattice, this theta term that you wrote is not, is not meaningful. It, it is meaningful in the continuum, but not on the lattice. Why there is a question on the lattice? Oh, continuum, sorry. Are these A's circle value or are they real? They are circle value, oh, I see. They are circle value? Mm -hmm. But then the derivatives don't make sense. In the in on the lattice, mm -hmm. but actually, one question I have here is: even you have uh, you even you are in the continuum, why can you why can't you make a large gauge transformation such that only change the flux in a certain region without in a, in a certain coordinate like x without touching the other? Because for each row, because uh, for each degree of freedom, the U1 is totally independent. On the lattice or in the continuum? Continue. So you have to specify what you mean by large gauge transformation. Are the gauge transformations continuous or not? What, what do you assume about them? So here the gauge transformation only means I actually throw a flux inside that hole. Something like a 1D, I throw a 2 pi flux in the ring. Okay, go on. And what does this term mean? So imagine now we have a defect where theta change from pi to zero. 
at this domain wall. And what happened here is, this is something like here, this is a high order topological insulator region and uh, outside it's either the vacuum or, or any trivial mild insulator. And from our previous argument, we know we have a spin one half zero mode, which contains a half magna. And from this term, the equation of motion also implies that whenever we have a corner kink for theta, where it changed from pi to zero, this corner kink should trap a half magnetic charge, which exactly represent a spin one half degree of freedom. Okay, so now I just demonstrate a new type of 2D high order topological insulator with a protect corner mode. And uh, this can be fulfilled by a Hamiltonian with a range change term. Now what I will do, what I will do is I will try to add some additional terms to drive a phase transition from this high order topological insulator toward a mod insulator. So apart from the previous ring exchange term I already have, inside each unit cell, this pink region, I turn on the XY interaction between two spins between the bond. So this is a frustration or competing order I want to introduce. And I assume the Hamiltonian only have two types of interaction. One is the Poiquet interaction between the unit cell. And the second is the, the XY interaction within the unit cell. So in two limit, when the Poiquet interaction dominant, then we, we know that we just have a high order topological insulator with a Poiquet entangled pattern. And once the XY interaction within the unit cell dominant, then all of the spins, a pair inside each pink region, inside each unit cell, and there's no entanglement between the side. So this is just a totally trivial mod insulator with several on-site singlet. And from our previous argument, we know that the high order topological insulator correspond to theta equal pi, while the trivial insulator correspond to theta equal zero. And the question is what happened when we tune the ratio between these two type of interaction? So this is actually motivated by some numerical simulation fulfilled by Frank Pullman's group. And what we find is by tuning the interaction between the plaque, intersite plaque interaction and intrasite bond interaction, there appear to be a continual phase transition. It's a, actually a second order phase transition from the numerical observation, which connects a trivial mod insulator phase to what a higher order topological insulator phase at the quantum critical point around the lambda equal 2.5. So this continual phase transition should be pretty interesting. First, in both phases, they have the same symmetry pattern. All of them respect the time reversal symmetry, subsystem U1 symmetry, and also respect the lattice C4 rotation symmetry. However, these two phases have distinct quantum number. One has a quadrupolarization at theta equal pi, the other has a quadrupolarization at theta equals zero. And how do we describe such kind of quantum critical point that connect two phases with the same symmetry but distinct topological patterns? So first, let's, let's have a hint. So suppose we're in the trivial mod insulator phase where the hot cold bosons are just localized within each unit cell. And then we try to turn on lambda, try to turn on the Plaquet interaction. So once the Plaquet interaction becomes comparable large, what it will do is it would allow the transport between the magna or say hot cold boson between sides. However, because we only have, because we have subsystem U1 symmetry constraint and we only have ring exchange term between the sides, a single magna, it is impossible for it to hope or transport between the sides. Instead, the leading order dynamics came from a pair of magna something like a particle pair, and they can only hope along 1D stripe, which is perpendicular to their dipole's orientation. So at a quantum critical point where the intrasite interaction, intersite interaction is comparable, it's more like a metallic phase where the charge degree of freedom at least have some mobility, but uh, a single charge cannot fluctuate. And uh, the only mobility came from a pair of charge. Okay. And now let's have another pictorial way to understand this quantum critical point. When the Plaquet interaction is large, we have a high order topological insulator where all of the patterns correspond to the Plaquet entangled pattern. When the 
intraside XY interaction is large enough, then we have a trivial phase where all of the spins are entangled within each unit cell. So this is something like the intracyte singlet. And when these two interactions are comparable, then these two patterns could percolate in space. So in spatially, we can see that there is strong percolation between two distinct patterns for higher order topological insulator at theta equal pi and a trivial insulator at theta equal zero. And once you have percolation, there is a domain wall which separates distinct region. And at the quantum critical point, the domain wall is strongly fluctuate in space time. But what does it mean by a domain wall? What happened on the domain wall? The domain wall itself is a spatial separation between the higher order topological insulator region and the trivial mod insulator region. So the smooth part of the domain wall is just a smooth boundary of the higher order topological insulator toward the vacuum or toward any trivial phase. And the smooth part of the boundary does not contain any degree of freedom. It is fully gapped. However, the tricky thing appear at the rough part of the boundary. The rough part or say the corner of this domain wall is actually the corner of the higher order topological insulator region, which would always contain a spin one half degree of freedom which is protected, provided at a quantum critical point there, the time reversal symmetry is not broken, either it's not broken explicitly and also not broken spontaneously. And at a quantum critical point, the domain wall pattern is strongly fluctuate. And the spin one half degree of freedom that is decorated or embellished inside the sharp corner of this domain wall is also strongly fluctuate in space. So how do they fluctuate? So there are different ways for a domain wall to fluctuate. So suppose I have a domain wall like this, or this is a more concrete illustration. And in principle, if I have a rectangle shaped large domain wall, it can shrink. It can shrink in different direction. So suppose the domain wall shrinked in this direction. What would happen is previously we have two spin one half degree of freedom here. And once the domain wall shrink, the two spin one half degree of freedom living at the corner of the domain will also hold and fluctuate in space. So these two spin one half degree of freedom is annihilated here and they're again created here. So the domain wall fluctuation is accompanied by a pair of spin one half degree of freedom I call the spin on fluctuate in the transverse direction and the transverse drive. And again, on the lattice model, this is more like a ring exchange term. Well, we can think about uh, there are various ways for a domain wall to fluctuate. For example, if I have a huge domain wall, one possible way for the domain wall fluctuate is it is just a shrinked by a small corner. So previously I have this domain wall. Now it is shrinked by a small corner. And what happened here is previously I have a spin one half degree of freedom here. Once the domain wall shrinked, then the previous spin one half degree of freedom at this corner is annihilated, but we have these three, three spin one half degree of freedom live at the corner. So again, on the lattice model, this is more like a ring exchange term, which annihilate a spin one half degree of freedom and create the other three at this side. Okay, so from this pictorial argument, what we learn here is at a quantum critical point, there is a strong fluctuation of the domain wall, which separate two distinct pattern. And the domain wall itself is, is pretty non-trivial. The smooth part of the domain wall, it's fully gapped. It doesn't contain any additional gapless degree of freedom. However, the rough part of the domain wall carries a spin one half degree of freedom. And as the domain wall's pattern is strongly fluctuated in space time, the spin one half degree of freedom embellished on the rough corner of the domain wall is also fluctuated in space. And however, the fluctuation is, is pretty, uh, it's pretty peculiar. A single domain wall cannot fluctuate along, in, uh, oh, sorry, a single spin one half degree of freedom in balance there cannot fluctuate alone. However, a pair of them can fluctuate along the transverse stripe. So actually what happened at a quantum critical point is, it's more like a dipole liquid. If we measure any type of spin-spin correlation function like magnon magnon correlation function, two point correlation function, we'll find they are always short-ranged correlated. 
However, there is a quasi long range order between the full spin correlation function between a dipole degree of freedom. So if we have a magnon dipole, a particle hole pair, which separate along x direction, and we measure this dipole correlation function on the same stripe separate along the transverse direction, we will find that we'll have a power law decay correlation function provided these two dipoles live on the same stripe. And this is manifest by the fact that a single spin cannot fluctuate in any direction, but a pair of spin can fluctuate along the 1D stripe akin to some 1D subdimensional particle. So their behavior is pretty similar to the 1D Lattinger liquid for these dipoles. And to manifest uh, this proposed framework, what we can do is, one thing we can do is we can calculate the static spectral function or look into the collective excitation at a quantum critical point. And if we have such kind of dipole liquid where a single charge degree of freedom is fully gapped, but a pair of charge, a dipole, can fluctuate along the winding stripe with a power law decayed quasi long range order, what can happen is if we measure the SZ, SZ static spectral function, what we will find is the zero energy point not just uh, appear at zero momentum. Instead, we should have a sub-extensive number of zero energy mode, which lives on kx and ky axis. So this is the theory proposal, and this is the numerical simulation done by the Tom group, where we find a, something like a Bose type of the Fermi surface, where the zero energy mode is extended along the both kx and ky axis. So at a quantum critical point, this is more like a Bose version of the Fermi surface where the zero energy mode finally forms a closed line in momentum space. And because we have extensive number of zero energy modes along the kx and ky axis, we have a large number of zero energy mode. And if we take out each patch from momentum space, say I fix the ky and only look at its dispersion along kx, it do behave like a 1D relativistic boson. So this is more like a strong coupled version of the 1D relativistic boson from both Kx and Ky axis. And where does this 1D relativistic boson came from? It came from the fact that a single charge cannot fluctuate in any direction, but a pair of charge, like a dipole, can fluctuate along the 1D stripe like 1D relativistic boson. And here, such kind of quantum critical point has some interesting behavior, like if we measure the specific heat because we have a large number of zero energy modes, the specific heat at a low temperature scale as T ln T, which is pretty similar to some of the marginal non-Fermi liquid we learn in two spatial dimension. And because we have a large number of zero energy modes, if we measure the entanglement entropy of the ground state at a quantum critical point, the entanglement entropy should have a violation of the area law. It should scale as L low and L because we have a large number of zero energy mode in both Kx and Ky axis. Uh, yeah, sorry, I think I missed something very basic. So in the previous slide is the A dynamical background. Okay, so sorry, I don't emphasize. So here theta is actually the face of the CP1 field and uh, A is dynamical. It came from the spin on degree of freedom. And here we have two branch. So now we can decompose them into one plus branch and one minus branch. The plus branch still carries a gauge field while the minus branch is its gauge neutral. And what happened is actually the plus branch would finally condense and it's fully gapped. And it is the minus branch which correspond to the magnum branch, the physical magnum branch still remain gapless at a quantum critical point. Uh-huh, uh, sorry, I guess, uh, which one is coupled to A? Plus, plus, plus one plus theta two. Theta one minus theta two is actually related with SZ, which is neutral. So do you mean at a critical point, uh, that A doesn't play much role? True, true. Okay, then uh, in the specific heat, why is there a log? Why is here a log? Uh, I guess your question is for Fermi, you would have that log if you just have that Fermi surface. Yeah. Yeah, the log actually came from the fact that the 
both on statistics and fermion statistics is a little bit different at low temperature. That is why there is a additional logarithmic correction. Uh -huh, but it, it yeah. just comes from a free boson theory. True, true. I see. Thanks. Yichi, uh, sorry, this is Andrzej Nevodomsky. Mm -hmm. I think I, I've missed uh, I've missed this point. So could you repeat again, how does the boson Fermi surface appears? In other words, why is the boson gapless along in this direction, qx equals zero for arbitrary qy? Mm -hmm. Because if I, I have a boson, which a single boson cannot hope, that means a partial x theta, theta, theta is actually the face of that sz is not allowed and a partial y theta is not allowed. Instead, a pair of boson, like a dipole, can only hope in the y direction, like the ring exchange term. It's something like partial x, partial y, theta. This term is allowed. So the dispersion is something like omega low energy proportion to kx, ky. And that is why we will have a zero energy branch at both kx and ky axis. And also a pictorial way to understand that is, that means whenever I fix a finite value for kx, even it's pretty large, it behaves mm -hmm. like a relativistic boson along the ky direction. And what does it mean by this picture? Fixed uh, kx, it's something like the fixed uh, length scale at x direction. So it's something like I have a dipole and I fix the length scale of a dipole. And how can the dipole fluctuate at a quantum critical point? This X dipole can only fluctuate along the one direction, like 1D relativistic boson. So it has a dispersion along the KY direction, like 1D relativistic boson. So you're saying ultimately this is linked to the subsystem symmetry, the fact that you could reserve True. the motion separately True. in the X or Y direction? True, exactly. I see. Hmm. And would you mind saying a few words about the this concept of the bose fermi surface? So okay, actually, I'm, I'm familiar about it, but but I'm not an expert. And from what I understood, um, the, you know, there are some subtleties about how you're going to boson condense um, bosons at um, you know on a manifold which is more than just zero dimensional. So how should we think about this? Okay, so there are various ways to. There are other literature talk about the Bose Fermi surface, like uh, Fisher's D wave theory or whatever. And here, what we mean by Bose surface, or the reason we call it Bose surface, I think this name is introduced by Fisher and also Aaron, is just because the zero energy mode is not just localized at some zero momentum point or high symmetric point. It is extended in, in, a, in a certain line, which do form like a closed loop or closed line in momentum space. And the problem is how can such kind of both surface be, be stable or is it possible to- That's exactly the yeah. Yes. So first, in the presence of subsystem symmetry, it is very stable. There's no way for you to lift them. If you lift them, you are breaking subsystem U1 symmetry. And here, if your Hamiltonian explicitly preserve that symmetry, subsystem U1 symmetry in two spatial dimension cannot be broken spontaneously because of merming wigner theory. And the problem is if, what happened if I slightly break that subsystem symmetry, say I turn on a very tiny term, which allow a single boson hoping term, it should be weak. And then that depends on the feeling. So for integer feeling, such kind of weak subsystem symmetry is always relevant. And then you just go back to the superfluid phase and then you just go back to the superfluid state. For fractional feeling, there is a finite regime where the subsystem symmetry breaking term is irrelevant at this liquid point. So in principle, there you could have an emergent subsystem U1 symmetry such that a weak subsystem symmetry breaking term turns out to be irrelevant and the IR fixed point still contains such type of symmetry. Mm -hmm. And what is the feeling in your case? Since uh, the feeling in my case is actually integer, so it's not stable. Because I, I actually have four spins per site and it's a timer time reversal symmetry. So it's more like half field. It's an integer yeah. field. So it's not stable at all. And actually it's true because previously the, the, the Munich group had already tried if apart from ring exchange term, if we have that uh, X, Y hoping term between the side, then the center part, one is the higher order TI, one is the trivial and the center part just becomes the superfluid phase. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you so much. Okay. Easy, just make sure, even though you call 
people's Fermi surface, but there is no Fermi statistic, right? Just make yeah, exactly, exactly. So we should call it the both surface. surface. No problem, thank you. Okay. And the most elusive phenomenon at this quantum critical point is there are some scaling which cannot describe by the renormalization group picture, and it's pretty counterintuitive. So as a one minute summary, what we know about the universality of the quantum critical phenomenon is if we measure the correlation function at a phase transition point or at a critical phase, or if we measure the energy and energy density, the scaling dimension of this operator is only dependable to the space-time dimension, to the locality, and to the symmetry of the system. It is irrelevant to any of the microscopic detail. And uh, this is true and can be demonstrated from the renormalization group picture because the renormalization group picture tell us we can always cross screen out the UV mode and only keep the long wavelengths IR mode as the essential description. And how many independent number of IR mode you have is only dependable to the symmetry to the locality and to the space time dimension of the system and sometimes also dependable to the dynamical exponent. And that is why we have such type of universality. But here at this quantum critical point, if we measure a certain type of correlation function at this critical point, like we measure the SZ, SZ correlation function, or more like the energy density correlation function, uh, it is power law decay, but uh, first it's only C4 symmetric. And second, uh, it's pretty anisotropic. So in a certain direction, it's more like power law in a more diagonal off diagonal direction, it's more long ranged. And doesn't fail into any of the known universality we know about. And second, if we measure the magnon magnon correlation in both spatial and uh, temporal direction, they are short range uh, correlated. It decay faster than any power law, but it decays slightly slower than the exponential. However, if I measure not the magnon magnon correlation, I measure the dipole dipole correlation, which is the spatial derivative of a magnon operator. That correlation function is power law. This is pretty weird and uh, counterintuitive because in the usual field theory, if I know this operator is irrelevant, then the higher order operator seems to be irrelevant as well by some simple dimension counting. And then in addition, the spatial derivative of this magnet operator means I'm looking into some rough configuration of the magnet creation operator. And usually the critical point of those rough configuration shouldn't play an important role. So if this is irrelevant or if this is short range correlated, I usually expect this should be short range correlated as well. But here it's counterintuitive because this is more quasi long range ordered. So what happened here? So what really happened here is the theory contains a subsystem symmetry. Because of subsystem symmetry, in the field theory pattern, there exists a large number of actually sub-extensive number of field configuration, which is strongly fluctuate in space, but they don't cost energy at all. They correspond to zero energy mode at a quantum critical point. So now the low energy mode is not just contributed by the long wavelength physics. A short wavelength physics or strong local fluctuation actually plays an extremely important role. This is also manifest from our both type of the Fermi surface and the, in the collective excitation spectrum. There, even at extremely high momentum, we can have zero energy mode. If we do a Fourier transform, this actually correspond to a mode which is strongly fluctuate along X direction, but being rather smooth in Y direction. These modes are UV mode coming from short wavelength physics, but they still survive at a quantum critical point at the low energy part of the spectrum at a quantum critical point. So what happened here is a large number of rough field configuration appear in the low energy part of the spectrum. So the quantum critical point is not just controlled by the long wavelength physics. Instead, these short wavelength modes or UV modes also plays an extremely important role at a quantum critical point that you can ignore them, that you cannot ignore them. And hence, here we cannot do any coarse grain because whenever we are doing coarse grain or something like a momentum space cutoff, we are ignoring some of the zero energy mode. In the usual theory, which is within the renormalization group picture, that might be fine because if the UV degree of freedom is fully gapped, once I coarse grain them out or integrate them out, they won't create any additional singularity and hence shouldn't uh, qualitatively change the behavior like the scaling dimension of an operator. But here, the UV degree of freedom also contains zero energy mode. 
So whenever you integrate them out, you are actually creating additional singularity and hence can qualitatively change the universality or the scaling dimension of, a, of an operator. So as a summary, for such kind of quantum critical point, this is a first, it's a critical point between a trivial mod insulator and a higher order topological insulator phase where they have the same symmetry pattern, but they have distinct topological number and they can be connected by a second order phase transition. And how does topology or symmetry protected topological invariant plays an important role at a quantum critical point? A pictorial way to understand a quantum critical point is we have some percolation between two distinct regions, and inside this domain wall, the domain wall is something like the previous spatial boundary between a high order topological insulator and trivial phase. Most part of the domain wall does not carry anything, but a rough part of the domain wall actually carries uh, something like a spin one half zero mode. So it's something like the previous zero mode at a high order topological insulator now try to dissolve into the bulk when you go into the quantum critical point. And because of subsystem symmetry and because of the fact that these modes are only localized at the corner, so this zero mode dynamics is pretty peculiar. A single spin one half zero mode cannot fluctuate in any direction, but a pair of them can only fluctuate along on a transverse stripe, like a quasi one dimensional particle. And hence, what we finally end up with is the quantum critical point is not just controlled by long wavelength physics. Instead, there exists a sub-extensive number of short wavelength modes, which survive at the low energy part of the spectrum at a phase transition point. And these short wavelength modes, because they are sub-extensive, they actually dominate the quantum critical point. So the usual coarse screen method does not appear here. And finally, we have lots of counterintuitive phenomenon like an operator is irrelevant, but a higher order operator becomes relevant at a quantum critical point. So I think I'm almost finished. And finally, just uh, say something about the uh, outlook. So today, the introduce a new type of quantum phase transition, which is beyond the ginsburg landau theory. That is not new, but it's also beyond the renormalization group picture because of subsystem symmetry and fracton dynamics. The short wavelength physics can play an extremely important role at a quantum critical point. So the universality is different from any of the universality we know from the renormalization group picture. And uh, this is just a tip of the iceberg. Today, I just uh, show a special type of phase transition beyond the RG that is a higher order toward a trivial mod insulator transition. And instead, uh, but in fact, uh, once you have subsystem symmetry or once you have fractal phenomenon, we can also think about a spontaneous sub subsystem symmetry breaking phase or any BKT-like transition where UVI or mixing also appears in such kind of quantum critical point because rough field configurations and short wavelength physics play an extremely important role. And there we can expect a lot of interesting phenomena. For example, previously the critical exponent at a phase transition point is only dependable to space time and to sometimes with additional anonymous dimension correction. But in this fracton type quantum critical point or with subsystem symmetry principle, we can even have some emergent fractal dimension, which is not related with our space time, but it's related with the dimension of your subsystem symmetry. And second, because the short wavelength physics plays an extremely important role and these high momentum modes can survive at the low energy part of the spectrum. In principle, these theory contain UVI are mixing. So the effective theory is very dependable to a UV cutoff. And hence we can expect some, some of the interesting phenomena like the high order operators could be more relevant than the lower, lower order operator itself because short wavelength physics play an important role. And these higher order operator could have more mixing and resonance with the short wavelength mode. That is why they finally play an important role and finally becomes the relevant operator that drives the phase transition. This could be pretty important when we are about to explore some of the fracton version of the quantum spin liquid. Usually when we look for a stable quantum spin liquid, we just look into the instant operator, it's relevant or not. But here, what we need to do is not just the instant operator itself, even the instant operator is irrelevant. It's pretty possible that some of the higher order instant or mono monopole operator could be relevant. And this operator could also play an important role because they can potentially confine some of the fracton type spin liquid phase. 
So I think I'm almost done and probably running out of time. And finally, I would like to thank my collaborator where the high order topological insulator model and theory is developed by Burnell from Minnesota and Taylor Hughes from UIUC and the numerical simulation of the model is accomplished by Frank Poema and Julian Bimbo from Munich. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yiji. So we have, uh, we have time for some questions, if anyone has a question. Um, may, I, um, may I ask one? Um, so, Yiji, so I would like to ask a question about the UVIR mixing. And mm -hmm. so, so you made a, um, a very, well, I said convincing argument about how the admixture, well, how the presence of, um, of short range uh, zero modes is responsible for essentially the physics not just being controlled by the long wavelengths. Mm -hmm. Could the same be said about the very first example that you gave in your talk, that of the Haldane chain? So if I look at um, a boundary, let's say I tune myself to the criticality between the SPT, AKLT phase and the normal phase of the chain, mm -hmm. right? And if you imagine those local, local spin half degrees of freedom proliferate, should I also think of them as being sort of local dislocations that are at zero energy, and therefore there's also UVIR mixing in that case? Okay, first, the, the short answer is no. And before I answer this question, I have to say, actually, I believe two people in the audience, Naki and Chu uh, are the very expert on UVIR mixing. Probably they can give you a more, more, more concrete answer, but actually for the one dimensional model, there's no UVIR mixing. What does it mean by UVIR mixing? It actually means that short wavelength physics play an important role. That means, as, at least here, we are looking at a quantum critical point, short wavelength modes can survive at the low energy part of the spectrum or some high momentum mode becomes a zero energy mode or low energy mode at a spectrum. Or if you look at a field configuration, that means the low energy mode is not just a smooth field configuration. It could have some rough field configurations at low energy. However, for the 1D model, it's more like a, the defect contains some decoration. That is why we have a, a West Wiener Witten term, but uh, the West Wiener Witten term itself is it's more like a, it's more like a long wavelength phenomenon because for the West Wiener Witten term, it actually tells you how many winding number does the O4 rotor has on a hypersphere. So it's not a local fluctuation. We are looking into the global fluctuation. And in order to have the UVIR mixing there, are, well, in high energy literature, there are other type of UVIR mixing because of the non-commutative geometry, but in condensed matter, two typical ways to have UVIR mixing is either we have something like Fermi surface or both type of the Fermi surface, such that once you do coarse grain, then you, in some certain direction, you might introduce additional low energy mode or exclude some additional low energy mode. So for Fermi surface, this is actually example of the UVIR mixing. So when we do renormalization group, theory for the Fermi, Fermi surface, we divide them into a Fermi patch. And when we renormalize that Fermi patch, what we do is actually we only do renormalize along the tangent direction. We won't do, it, do any renormalization along the parallel direction. Otherwise you are enlarging the Fermi patch or shrinking the Fermi patch. And here that's the same. Like here, there are still some type of special renormalization. If we want to renormalize the theory along this patch, we can only renormalize along the transverse direction such that uh, doing this renormalization, I won't touch additional zero energy mode, but I cannot cross grain along the parallel direction because there you are excluding or introducing additional zero energy modes. Um, and so thank you for the, for the answer, Yiji. I, I think I understood, but just sort of at the surface of it, the analogy between the first part of the talk, which I realized was the motivation, is the fact mm -hmm. that you had this uh, theta term which was allowed to take values in that case, zero or two pi, or they were discrete. And then the local defect, which would proliferate at the phase transition, mm -hmm. would somehow fluctuate, right? Between the Yes, two exactly. Right. So the same analogy sounds like would be made for the second part of the talk, where you say, look, I could either have this quadrupolar phase, or well, quadrupolar uh, higher order topological order, in which case I have theta equal pi, it's a discrete mm -hmm. value, mm -hmm. or I could have um, you know, trivial regions, we see mm -hmm. the zero. And mm -hmm. so very superficially, just following the same analogy, you would argue, well, could one not argue exact same thing you did in the first part of the talk? And if you can, then why is it this UVIR mixture appears in the latter, but not in the former example? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so yeah, actually the reason why I introduced the first example is there a pictorial way to see how does the quantum critical point appear is the previous H degree of freedom now dissolve into the bulk because they appear as the domain wall between distinct region and one domain wall is fluctuating. This H mode is also fluctuating. And here that's the same, but it's still different, slightly different. If we are just dealing with a normal SPT phase where the extended part of the boundary is gapless, then this picture might also hold, and this is what Xie and uh, Dong Haili explored in 2D SPT phase transition, such that if the domain will fluctuate, then you will have a one-dimensional zero mode or dispersive, uh, any, uh, dispersive gapless mode, which is strongly fluctuate with, with, with the domain wall. Uh, but here, if the, what is, why is it different from the first story and why it has UVI mixing is the zero energy mode only appears at the corner. And um, it's also because we have explicit subsystem symmetry. So the magnon can only fluctuate, a single magnon cannot fluctuate. And once these domain will fluctuate, what we will see is your single spin one half zero mode cannot fluctuate alone, accompanied by the fluctuation or any type of shrinking of the domain wall. Instead, the only dynamics, it's more like a fractal dynamics where a pair of them can fluctuate. Thank you. Cool. Well, once you're at it, I think there's a slight uh, omission here. In the 2020 paper, I had a co-author who, in fact, did more than I did. And this is Shu Heng Shao. So I mm -hmm. think he, if you give a yeah. reference, you should give reference to both of us. Yeah, sure. Next time, Will. I believe there are more also there. There are no more. It's the first, uh, it's the first one, the 2D1 Plaque XY model, that one. This is the first paper we wrote on this subject. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I wasn't, this wasn't a single author paper, so I think you should mm -hmm. take it. Mm -hmm. What's wrong? Raise your hand. Uh, yeah, I had a question. So, um, about uh, the statement that UV degrees of freedom matter, um, if I just have a Fermi surface, like normal Fermi surface, there also you have a dense scale KF inverse. Mm -hmm. Would you say again that's, I mean, that's, yes, I mean, we certainly we deal with within, I mean, that's standard RG in some sense when we do RG for Fermi. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not as standard as what you will do for, let's say, ON model, but it's still. At least within some, I mean, one would call that. Um, I mean, one wouldn't call that beyond RG, I guess. But here you want to say that. I mean, yeah. So can you contrast these two things between many? Yeah, but uh, actually, first uh, they don't call it beyond uh, RG. But I remember, like Sensei Lee, when he studied that renormalization of the various Fermi patch, already mentioned that um, UVI are mixing because once you core screen each patch. Uh, do renormalization each patch, you have to take one specific direction and uh, renormalize uh, one tangent direction and do not touch the other direction and hence keep the size of the Fermi surface to be fixed. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. They are, it's, it's not as, as standard as I would say ON model mm -hmm. RG, but would you say that that's as non-standard as this one or is this even more somehow? I mean, it doesn't seem, yeah, but you say that this is somehow even more non-standard. Yeah, one thing here is sense. because it is extended along the kx ky direction. One of the observation we will have, and probably at least I don't know, but probably you can correct me, doesn't appear in the Fermi surface is something like if I measure that uh, this this is more like a dipole dipole correlation function, and um, the the power law in the temporal direction and also power law in the tangent in the y direction. However, if I change the length scale of X, like I change mm -hmm. the scale of the unit cell, then you will find the power law exponent alpha here can change once you change the length scale of X. So it's something like the cutoff or the light scale along X direction can change the scaling dimension of the operator or the exponent here. Sure, yeah, yeah, because we have a special, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, sure. I think it's confusing to call it the scaling dimension because this theory as you present it, does not have scaling symmetry. 
the logical order is that you have a system which has a scaling symmetry and then you classify operators according to their scaling dimensions. If you have a system which is not scaling down in, the notion of scaling dimension doesn't make sense. True, it doesn't have full scale invariance, but uh, if you, maybe there are, might be some subtlety here, it has a reduced scale invariance at least for this specific model for type two fracton that probably doesn't exist. First of all, there are no fractons here, but if you look at the correlation function for S plus and S minus that you wrote, the, the middle one, mm -hmm. it's not consistent with any scaling symmetry. Mm -hmm. So how can you say the system has scale symmetry? I make T bigger and the correlation function changes in a complicated way. So the, mm -hmm. this correlation function that you wrote is not consistent with any scaling symmetry. And if mm -hmm. there's no scaling symmetry, you shouldn't discuss scaling dimension. Mm -hmm. Because scaling is not a symmetry of the problem. Uh, can I make one more comment about the Fermi surface? Mm. Uh, so you, you just described the UVL mixing in the Fermi liquid or non Fermi liquid, but I think what you were describing applies to the cases with dimension larger than two. Uh, we, if the dimension is two and uh, where we have a one dimensional Fermi surface, uh, that's mm -hmm. not regarded as having UVL mixing. Mm -hmm. The reason is actually let's consider non Fermi liquid where the Fermi surface is coupled to a gapless bosonic mode. Mm -hmm. uh, then if the dimension is larger than two, then you can see for a fixed momentum, for, for a fixed momentum of the critical boson, there's a, there's a dimension, there's a, at least a one dimensional manifold of gapless modes, which are strongly coupled to, on the firm surface, which are strongly coupled to this bosonic mode, but in- Which bosonic uh, mode? Any gapless bosonic mode. Mm -hmm. It can either be some uh, symmetry breaking order parameter or be some U1 gauge field. Uh -huh. Then uh, if the dimension is larger than two, then there's at least a one dimensional manifold of fermionic modes on the Fermi surface that are strongly coupled to this bosonic mode with a large scattering, with a large space for scattering. But mm -hmm. two D, two plus one D, uh, this one dimensional thing becomes a zero dimensional. And in that case, uh, usually people don't say there's UVM mixing. And that's why uh, the patch based theory is supposed to be applicable in two plus one D non Fermi liquid problems. Mm -hmm. In three plus one D, you need to, uh, one thing one can do is to view the KF, which is analog of the lattice, lattice spacing here, mm -hmm. also as a scaling variable such that mm -hmm. when you do scale transformation, usually mm -hmm. uh, when you do a scale transformation, you multiply space and time, then the correlation yeah. function multiplied by some factor. Here, mm -hmm. you also need to multiply the, besides multiplying the space and time, you also need to multiply the Fermi momentum as well. Mm -hmm. I see. So does it have to be a, something like a spherical? 3D surf, a Fermi surface, if, if it's a cylinder one, like yeah. a weak coupled layer, then you again don't have that. Uh, I think you still do. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, we can end there. Um, thanks again, Yiji. Yeah, thanks.